All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Davis. Um, I'm a beamline scientist at the SSRL, and I am recording this talk in advance um, for the, the XAS school that we're putting on. I heard we have quite the turnout, um, something like 700 of you folks joining us. Um, so that's pretty exciting. I don't think we've ever done anything this large. I usually give this talk to, you know, 50 people-ish in person. Um, this is the first talk I've ever given that's been pre-recorded, and it's the first talk I've ever kind of given in my garage. Um, so welcome to my garage, wherever you're at. I'd say welcome to the SSRL, but I'm not there. Um, so I guess the point of this talk really is um, to get you ready for coming to perform experiments with the SSRL. Uh, when and if that ever happens again, or when that happens again. Um, I will have a little slide in closing to talk about how we're adapting to COVID and how we're gonna move forward with that. Um, it's pretty short, um, but initially what I wanna talk about is, um, kind of like what the point of this talk is. You know, we have users show up and I, I really want, you know, show up raring to go with samples and they're like, we're here to do experiments and they don't really know much about the technique. They don't know much about sample preparation. They don't know much about available things that we have to make their experimental journey smoother. Um, so, you know, we have dinosaurs rushing in and tripping on something and falling flat on their face. Um, or, you know, just People come in, you know, moving kind of smoothly and they think they know what they're doing and they spin out of control and have to be helped. But, you know, neither of these things are bad. That's what we're here for. That's what beamline scientists are here for is if this does happen, we'll help, we'll help you back up and get you moving forward. Um, but to minimize these types of events, we'll uh, give you a little education. So the first I want to start with is just going, you know, the more knowledge you have before you show up to the beamline, the better. Um, so I want to go over a few resources that will help you kind of learn about the nuts and bolts of the experiment and kind of what it's capable of uh, gleaning from your data or gleaning from your samples. Um, there's a, a lot of websites. The, the XAS community has been, in the last 20 years, have been extremely helpful in disseminating as much ex information as possible. They, you know, there's websites, there's tutorials, there's apps, there's uh, mailing lists, which we'll talk about, there's books. Um, one of the first websites that I like is this Zafs, it used to be just zafs.org. Um, it's gone to zafs.xrayabsorption.org, and especially this first tab, it's the trainings, books, and other resources. And if you look on here, there's the training workshops and short courses, and a lot of how I've learned this stuff is still up on this website from kind of the pre, a lot of the preeminent. Uh, folks who work in this field um, have given their talks, this slide decks from their talks, so you can go over them. And there's different tutorials. And I definitely recommend starting here if you have no a priori knowledge about this technique and think it's right for you. Um, another, there, there's books out. So this uh, Zaps for Everyone by Scott Calvin has been out for probably six or seven years now, something like that. And it's kind of become du jour for uh, books for people on the beamline. I see it, a lot of users bring it with them. It goes over in varying degrees of depth uh, and with different points of view, all these animal characters you see on the cover here kind of represent different aspects of different users um, to XAS data collection and ask different questions and present different points of views. And it's nice, It's um, I like it a lot. Um, for a more kind of succinct, more, um, you know, sub, hundreds of pages is Matt Newville's Fundamental X apps. And this is free. You can, it's available on the, the previous link I showed you before. It um, is very thorough and will kind of walk you through an experiment start to finish with all the math and theory involved. Um, and then for some beamline tools, there's a, this is Hephaestus right here on the top left. And it is kind of a beamline tool that will give you, help you find edges, um, fluorescence lines. It'll help you calculate flux in a beamline if you know the length of your ion chambers and the gas involved. And if you don't, just ask your beamline scientist. 
Um, it has, if you want to do KK transform, it has F prime and F double prime, and it even has a sample mass calculator that you'll show later. And a lot of the same tools are available in X-ray Tills um, that Sam wrote. It used to be an iOS app, and now it's hosted um, at Quantum. And you can see the link down here. It has a lot of the same tools. It also has current status of synchrotrons you're at. You can switch it there. So it's showing the SSRL, which is currently down, um, as we are in a shutdown of sorts. Um, and you can see at the bottom, it has different elements for finding lines, your absorption, flux. And I have this on my phone. Um, it's handy when you don't have, you know, the orange book or a periodic table in front of you to find your edges. Um, one of my favorite resources is Bruce Ravel has been kind enough to put us on his speaker deck website up with basically numerous, I, there's probably at least a couple dozen talks up there that he's put on there, you know, like the one showing here that's advanced topics and catalysis. Um, and the, it's helpful. I still go to this website. I've been doing this a long time and I don't know everything and I forget a lot more than I know. And when, you know, if I have hard problems to solve with structure refinement or whatnot, this is where I come and look and um, they're all pretty amazing. And if you, get stuck here, I would recommend starting with uh, these three, the resources I've given you now up to this point uh, before moving on to the next one, which is the IFF at mailing list. And you can come here too. They have an archive that's searchable. And so if you have a question, you can just search it and odds are somebody's asked the question you've asked before. And the folks involved in this are super responsive, super helpful to the point of I can't believe how helpful they are and how patient they are with some of the questions that pop up. And I recommend doing your due diligence before you ask a question. You know, these are a lot of people with jobs and lives and, you know, they um, want you to kind of do the work before you um, come ask a question. So yeah, on the mailing list, you can see here, and then it has join the mailing list. So you get an update every time somebody asks a question, you get it in your email. Um, you can browse the, pub, browse the public archive, which is really helpful. Um, I just, for instance, I've started kind of writing macros in Larch, which is Matt Newville's um, XAS, Pythonic XAS um, data reduction uh, and data analysis package. And there's been enough people that have asked questions already that I didn't, I was able to answer my question without having to bother anybody and keep moving forward. So I really recommend this. This is super helpful. And I mean, even there's lots of basic questions, you know, sample preparation, which we'll touch on very briefly here. There's, you know, data analysis question, synchrotron questions. So again, I can't iterate enough that, you know, start, try, try to answer your own questions before reaching out to the community or, um, or even email your BMI scientist before this. So uh, kind of moving on to the nuts and bolts is, you know, is XAS right for you? Is it, a technique that you'll find useful. Generally, when I ask this question, um, I'm standing in a room and there's people here and they've flown from somewhere around the world to come come see this talk. And, you know, since this is online now, maybe some of you people are just using this, some of you folks are just using the school to see if it is right for you. So I'll kind of spend a little more time here than I normally would. And normally I'd say, yeah, you're, you came here using your own time and money to get here. So yeah, it's probably right for you. Um, it's right for you probably because there aren't many, many sample requirements in terms of like state of matter, symmetry, or crystallinity. Um, samples can be just about any state of matter, um, solids, liquids, amorphous. Uh, we could do organometallics, solutions, gases. Um, it really, there's not much we can't do. Um, the limitations, like I said, are generally a product of beamline availability. So can we get our beamline to the range? Like if you wanna look at the carbon K edge, uh, we probably can't help you with our standard spectroscopy beam lines. That is, you can do that with different techniques, um, with, you know, high vacuum, low energy stuff, but that's not a standard we'll, we'll talk about here today. Um, and another a thing is like sample preparation. Is it, a, is, are you, do you want to look at rocks? Well, that's kind of hard. We can do some things for it. Um, homogeneity. Um, and there's ways we can work around when you think you can't do it. we come up with a lot of solutions to solve problems with sample state issues. Is it too thick, too thin, not enough sample? And we'll talk about some of that. Um, a better question, like I said, or what do you hope to learn? So you've probably seen this twice already. Um, things you can learn from Zanes are oxidation state, a coordination environment, um, 
at Ligon Field. You can get fingerprinting. Um, and from the XFs, you can get coordination number, the identity of a neighboring atom within, you know, a certain um, kind of Z greater than five accuracy, bond distances, and disorder, something that you may have a crystalline sample that shows a highly ordered XRD pattern, but locally it might be disordered. And you can see the two, they're actually very complementary techniques. So, and the big boon is there's no spectroscopically silent atoms. Um, you don't have to worry about, you know, your irreducible representation doing that to see if it's vibrationally available to look at IR or is your dipole strong enough. Um, we just put it in the beam. So uh, in experimental anatomy, you've again probably seen this and we'll, you'll see it a bunch. Um, uh, most spectroscopy beam lines, especially at the SRL, SSRL, are pretty similar. Um, they each kind of have different skill sets of sorts. They have a different sweet spot. They have um, different monochromator crystals depending on the energy range and energy resolution and different fluorescence detectors, which we'll get a little bit more into as we go along. Um, and this affects your beam line sweet spot. Um, so, for instance, 4.3 likes is 4.3 and 14.3, which we'll talk about these tender X-rays. 4.1 uh, is a hard X-ray. Um, you can collect. So you have your X-ray source, which in this case is a synchrotron. Obviously, um, you get white beam or uh, collimated beam from a, a mirror if your beam line does that. Bounces off a, a silicon crystal. It, the SSRL generally it's a silicon 220 or a silicon 111, and it comes into the hutch through some slits, uh, through I0, hits your sample, and if you're looking at fluorescence, your fluorescence texture will generally be here at perpendicular to the beam, um, I1 and I2. And so this is what it really looks like. This is beamline 4.1. Um, you can see that the red arrow shows the beam path um, and immediately goes through some hutch slits right here. You can see these are JJ slits. Um, and they're used to define the beam size from the after the monochromator, and that you know anywhere from two millimeters vertically to ten millimeter, uh, ten millimeters horizontally, uh, down to the you know micron size beam um, if it's focused and you can aperture it after that. Um, we have an ion chamber, which is the, here is I zero. It's your first ion chamber, and that monitors incoming flux. It's your empty cube at UV this experiment. It's um, before the sample. Here at 4.1, we have a, a flight path, and that's just to get the beam to the sample with minimum air scatter and minimum air absorbance. So you get your higher quality sig signal, higher, more flux at the sample with less air scatter into your fluorescence detector. If you need. Um, uh, a sample holder of some sort, in this case, it's an LN2 cryostat. Um, and we'll go over to all, a lot of the different types of sample environments we have at the SSRL available for you. Uh, ion chamber, after a second flight path, you can see a second flight path on the other end of the sample. Uh, and then I, in this case, you see I1, which would be, you would use for your field cuvette, I guess, after the sample. So uh, beam, characterizing the beam after it's gone through your sample. And this is important if you're doing a transmission experiment. Um, and then in this case, you can see a fluorescence detector. Here it's a, a germanium 30 element discrete, 30 discrete element germanium detector. Um, we have different geometries and beam lines. So at 9.3, you can see there's a, a liquid helium cryostat, uh, 100, 100 element detector. 11.2, um, this is a giant yellow tent you can see surrounded by it. Um, and before the, hut, the slits, which you saw in the 4.1, is a harmonic rejection mirror. And so we bounce the beam off of this to get rid of harmonics. It's a rhodium coated um, zero Durer mirror. And we can change the angle of that before it hits your sample, getting rid of harmonics and uh, a different format of a hundred element detector that we also have. So how do you choose the right beam line? Um, you kind of want to go through, we'll go through each of the beam lines that are available um, at the SSRL for spectroscopy. Um, and what you'll see is for beamline 93, you'll see its energy range, the detectors available there. And this is somewhat flexible. We can move detectors around to a certain degree, but we, these are generally somewhat stationary. Um, and then the beamline scientists for each beamline. Um, and if you have a question, the beamline, this is the person you're going to reach out to. And if you're having trouble getting hold of them, you can always talk to our staff scientists who are field experts, uh, John Barger and Reedy Sarangi. 
who are, you'll hear from them during this school. You've probably heard from them already. Um, so we have 7.3, which, uh, well, 9.3 has historically was a bio XASB mine and is kind of transitioning to continuous scanning and um, a lot does a lot of catalysis work now. Uh, and then we moved to 7.3, which has historically done a lot of bio XAS, but um, it's, uh, in our new COVID world, this might be shifting somewhat. Um, it is six to 40 keV. It has a 30 element germanium and a lytle end up pips. All, all beam mines have a lytle and pips now, I believe. Um, and we'll talk about the difference between those two later on. Um, 4 1 is my beam line. Again, it's kind of the sister beam line to 7 3. I think they're nearly identical. Um, so, not much to talk about there. Um, and then we have our tender x ray lines 14 um, 3 and 4 3. And they go to you low tender x ray, so you can do um chlorine sulfur work sulfur is a big uh big big time they use do a lot of sulfur work at these beam lines uh, and they have pips a lidl detector vortex detector uh we now at 4.3 we have a seven element vortex with quantum electronics meaning we can run these things pretty hot and still stay out of a dead time regime which if that doesn't mean anything to you it will eventually um meaning we can get better data quality faster is the take home. And then we have 11.2, which is kind of, it's also my beam line and it's, it's kind of unique uh, at the synchrotron in the sense that it can do, it can run focused or unfocused. It runs six to about 38 keV. Um, and we have a lot of uh, added capability there in terms of uh, surface sensitivity. It has a hundred element detector. Um, and a very large hutch. It's also the place we do a lot of our rad work. Um, so it kind of fills a niche that um, is unique at the synchrotron. So uh, I mentioned all these fluorescence detectors and we're gonna talk about them. There's kind of two different types. We have a non-energy discriminating, which counts all photons. Um, it doesn't tell you the energy of them. A photon is a photon and it counts it as signal. Um, and so a scattered photon counts the same as a fluorescent photon, and so you should think about doing scatter rejection. It's pretty standard at SSRL, um, and you want to ask your beamline scientist because how it's set up is generally energy and element specific. Um, we have two varieties available, and they're both, like I said, both generally available all beamlines. We have a PIPS detector, which is personally my favorite. Um, PIPS stands for passivated interplanar silicon, and since it's silicon, they're generally, they, they, their efficiency drops off with energy because they don't have the stopping power. It's not high enough Z to stop photons high energy. Um, although that is changing as they're making them thicker and thicker, um, we'll probably move away from Lytle with time, um, which is what we'll talk about next. But the thickness of silicon um, increases the probability that a, photo, a photon interaction with the silicon will occur, creating signal. Um, it's a simple explanation. And so the more photons you can stop, the better signal you get. Um, <clears throat> and at, with thin silicon, that's not always the case. Um, a LIDL detector is uh, also useful at most relevant XAS energies. Um, when, as we go above 25, 30 keV, this is what we use. It's kind of a stacked ion chamber of sorts. Um, there's usually five sets of gold grids with argon filled up around them and so you create, a, you, you ionize the argon gas and you create a current and that's how you count um, your signal. And these are available at all beam lines. Um, I prefer a PIPS if I can. Uh, and some, if you can't use a PIPS, then you use a lot. Um, we also have energy discriminating detectors, which are people of monitoring specific fluorescence energies. So they do post-processing, a photon hits, and then we have some electronics that do some manipulation and they'll give you what we call an MCA trace that you can see on the right hand side here. Um, you, it gives, it'll integrate the, the energy of the photon hitting and it'll give you all these peaks. Um, you can see two windowed here. It looks like it's, these are high energy. So this might be, um, actually I don't know what it is. It's been a long time since I took that. Um, but we have three, avail three varieties available. We have a, a 30 element discrete germanium detector, and these are available at 4.1 and 7.3. And these are really nice. They behave really well. Um, since the elements are discrete, you don't get much crosstalk between the unique uh, detector elements. Um, they're both 
really new, so their rise times are good. Their noise is pretty low. Um, they do saturate at you know around 100,000 counts per second. So that's something you take out, and that's something you'll discuss with your beamline scientist. Um, but we are moving over to advanced electronics soon for these, so we'll be able to run them, I guess, hotter, with more photons without saturating them, or what we call going dead. So going dead, it goes dead, which means for every photon, you don't count every photon. So um, uh, you, you can do a dead time correction to fix that, and that's kind of outside the scope of that, but again, that's something you want to talk to your beam mic scientist about. Um, we have a 100 element detector, and this is a germanium monolith. Um, so it means it's a single chunk of germanium that's seg not segmented, but it has 100 unique electronic contacts with it in the back, creating like a pixelated detector. Um, and so you, you, count, uh, you can count a lot more photons and this excels in the really dilute regime. Um, so low PPM or, you know, hundreds of PPM regime of sample concentration, and they're available at 11, 2, and 9, 3. And then we also have a, a similar, I mean, it's also uh, vortex detectors. We have a seven and a four element, um, and these are nice. I like their, again, you have the same problem with stopping power. You know, germanium detectors are better at high energy, meaning they you create a photo electron for photons that hit that are higher energy, whereas in a silicon situation, the, the photon might go straight through and you don't count it. And so, you know, the silicon drifts, they're generally better below 20K, uh, 20, 15 to 20 kV, they're net better in all sense. They have better electronics, better signal to noise, better rise time, better um, energy resolution. Uh, but they, again, they just don't work very well at high energy and they don't pack very well. You don't get 30 and 100 element silicon drift. And they're available at 4.3 and 14.3 uh, respectively. So to, Detector selection criteria. So how, how do you decide what detector do you want? So in general, um, kind of a rule, you know, broad scopes is your initial thing is the analyte concentration range. What is your, your element of interest? How concentrated are you? Um, so for, you know, a half weight percent to three weight percent, you choose a PIPS or a LIDL detector, but you have to be aware of self-absorption because as you get high up in that regime, you start uh, self-absorption may, may or may not become a problem, but you also need to, um, you could be in a transmission regime, uh, depending on a lot of things, matrix effects, um, the Z of your element of interest, um, and then less than a half weight percent, and even maybe lower than that, you can go to an energy discriminating detector. Um, alternatively, if you have a lot of fluorescence, but you want a, a, you know, a, some kind of multi-element type sample where they all fluoresce in a similar regime, and you only need to look at a small subset, like if you want to look at manganese, in a chromium oxide, you know, above the manganese edge, you're going to be fluorescing manganese, but you're also going to be fluorescing a lot of chromium. And so in that sense, a non-energy discriminating detector isn't going to help you a whole lot because it's going to be flooded by all that chromium fluorescence. But you can window on the manganese region of interest and, you know, ignore to a certain degree the chromium fluorescence and get um, a viable signal from that. And we do that a fair bit. It's, um, or if you go to extremely low concentration, so the 100 element detectors at 11, 2, and 9, 3, we'll look at a single PPM of, of uh, arsenic in a realistic soil sample. Um, so with a lot of scattering and competing fluorescences, and we get really high quality data from situations like that. So, you know, I mean, it sounds like energy discriminating detectors are the way to always go. Um, and they sound awesome. You can always just pick the line you want to look at, window it, and hit go and collect good data. And that's somewhat true in certain situations. Um, um, sorry, here we go, the window popped up. Um, but they suffer from lower, lower signal of noise than LIDL and PIPs, which means longer collection times. Also in higher count rate situations, if you're using a model, if you can get crosstalk where you get um, basically shared charge between channels, which kind of creates a broadening of your um, energy resolution. So you want to, if you don't have to use them, don't. You should, should get away with a PIPS or a LIDL detector um, or transmission if that's the kind of concentration that you're in. Um, so now that you've, you've got beam time or you've got, I say beam time, but you should know this stuff before. So I guess if, if you're applying for beam time, how do you choose which beam time? 
So let's say you are one of the first XAS experimenters ever and you want to look at silver chloride, right? It's got a heavy element and a light element. Um, and so you're kind of at, and you need to look at the kids of both. And so you're kind of at opposite ends of the available energy ranges we have at the SSA. Um, so, you know, the silver cage is at 25 keV and the chlorine cage is at 2.8 keV. So an order of magnitude difference, which puts you in two completely different experimental regimes in terms of sample preparation and how you'll collect it. Um, so you may, you'll probably need two B mines. And so if you look at what B mines are suitable, you know, you can look at 4-1 goes up there. You know, most of the uh, hard X-ray B mines will go um, to the, will collect the silver cage. Um, but only one or only four or four three or fourteen three are capable of doing the chlorine. Actually, only four three. I'm sorry, I don't know if fourteen three does the chlorine cage. Like it says it does. Um, so that's that you'll that's kind of the the mindset that you'll use when you decide what B mines you need based on your samples. So for this sake, we'll we'll do uh, four one for silver and four three for chlorine. So what what next? What about sample prep? How do you mount these? Um, Silver chloride is concentrated in both elements um, and samples with high concentrations are generally collected in a transmission experiment. Um, and kind of to get a ballpark where you should start and how you should prep your sample is how much, how much silver chloride would you need for a transmission experiment? And you want kind of an edge step of one to 1.5. We'll use 1.5 for here. And an edge step you'll learn about later is how the big of jump from below edge to, from pre-edge to post-edge. and you can be too low or too high, and kind of the acceptable range of that is, you know, 0.1 to 2, uh, depending, uh, it's kind of, it's depending on your situation. Um, Hephaestus, which we talked about earlier, includes, it's included with the IFF software package, has a nice little um, formula, so you can keep the total cross-section of the material. So you can put in your silver chloride here, you can look up your density for your material if you don't ballpark it. Um, as best as you can, and it'll spit out a couple of numbers here. You can see that it'll spit out an absorption length. And this number is important because you really need to ensure that the particle size of your sample is smaller than this if you can. Um, what happens if this number is too big is you can get distorted spectra. Uh, and also the second number here. So it tells you how many milligrams of sample you will need in one square centimeter to get an absorption edge of one and a half. Um, so or well, this is one absorption length, I'm sorry, for a single absorption length at the, and you can see the energy here, at the silver cage. Um, and so what do these numbers mean? Um, so our area, so this, that we're gonna use, this, this calculation is based on one square centimeter. And Adam Hoffman will talk about this in a lot more detail than we'll talk here, um, is, uh, so we have about 0.45 square centimeters and we want an absorption length of one and a half. So we take that 27, 23.7 milligrams, um, our sample area. So this will be defined by the sample holder that you use. And this form factor is variable depending on your beamline synchrotron, you know, technique. Um, so this number will change and then times one and a half. So we'll need a total of 16 milligrams of silver chloride in a 0.45 square centimeter area to get an absorption lake of one and a half. Um, and that'll give you good data. And so you, you could put a little more, a little less, and some of this is trial and error, but this is a good starting point. And so for some of our bigger sample holders, to get 16 milligrams of silver chloride may not fill it, so you might have to dilute it with boron nitride or some kind of low x-ray interacting, x-ray opaque kind of filler material. People use boron nitride, they use sugar, a uh, number of silica in some cases. Um, or you can smear it very finely on tape and spread it out, which is kind of my preferred method. Um, that way, if you underestimate, sometimes you can just double up your tape layers. And I'll give you a quick kind of overview of a basic solid sample prep preparation. So a lot of times, good old tape is just the way to go. You can use Scotch Magic Transparent Tape, um, Kapton Tape, and Polypropylene. And these are all generally available at the Synchrotron if you can't get them. Um, but you need to be aware of impurities in your tape. Some tape, ha if you're looking at the sulfur edge, you need low sulfur tape. Scotch tape, can ha I can't remember, but it has some metals in it. Um, so if you're unsure, you can definitely do, put a blank piece of tape in the B-mine and see if you get any signal from it, um, especially in a fluorescence experiment. 
Um, so you're gonna weigh it out and then you need to grind it. This grinding step can't really be overstated how important this is. You need sample particle sizes smaller, if possible, than your absorption length. And so grind, grind, grind. In a lot of cases, sieve, sieve, sieve. Make sure, you know, don't leave this a chance if you don't have to. Um, put some Kapton tape down, tape it on both sides, and then you can smear, lightly smear it across the tape. I kind of had to hobble together two talks here because um, my when I did this a couple of years ago, my sample didn't come out very well. And Matt Newville, very kindly, his, the link for it here is put this up um, for it online. Um, and so he, what he does is smears across the tape, chops up the tape, and then stacks them all up here, and then tapes those together. And the thing you need to also do is you need to check for pinholes. Make sure um, if, you know, people do this to varying degrees of precision. Some people use a microscope. You can hold it up to the light at a bare minimum. Make sure you, no light gets through. Um, this is le uh, not as important if you're doing a fluorescence experiment. It, uh, you're less susceptible to problems, but if you're in a transmission, kind of geometry, you need to make sure that you don't get pinholes. You, it can cause a lot of problems and a lot of distortions with these pinholes because then you have x-rays that are passing through into I1 unperturbed by your sample and can create a lot of problems. Um, so the low Z case, the kind of chlorine, I kind of call it the homeopathic regime is you kind of want the idea of some sample in there. Um, and when you do the same calculation for chlorine and silver chloride, and the only number here different is the edge energy, you can see that now your absorption length is 2.2 .2 microns. So you may not get small enough particles to do this experiment. You might have to do something where sieving won't get you enough. There's techniques called raising the fines. Um, there's a number of different techniques that you can look into, talk to your beamline scientists about to make sure you get small particle sizes. And you can see that the one absorption length here, if you're gonna do a transmission experiment, is 1.2 milligrams. So a very, very small amount. Um, so for these types of experiments, they're almost, I mean, they are always collected in a fluorescence regime. And therefore the mass must be even in smaller. And that's where I get at the homeopathic. You kind of just want a dusting, if it's a high concentration sample of the sample on the tape on one side, because x-rays actually are absorbed significantly by Kapton and polypropylene tape, a uh, certain, a fair amount at this energy. Um, so here again, you know, weigh it out, grind it up, and then you smear it here. And even this is probably too much sample in some cases for a silver chloride. Um, so definitely talk to your beamline scientist about your sample preparation before you get here. But this was just to get you thinking about, you know, what the different things you need to, it's not meant to be exhaustive. It's just to kind of get your brain thinking about your samples and what you hope to achieve at the B-mine and then what you need to do before you get here or there, because I'm not there, I'm in my garage. Um, and to get your startup as smooth as possible when you're on a B-mine. Um, so there's different ways. You know, what if you only have a small amount of sample and you need to get it in a, into a sample or you can press a pellet. You can mix your sample with a diluent and press a pellet. Um, you can have dyes fabricated that will get very, that are customized for your beam line so that fit the beam size. Um, like I said, they allow for compressing diffuse or high surface area samples into a smaller space. Um, it also helps with, if you're doing in situ experiment in a furnace or a cryostat or harsh sample environments, they make them more kind of mechanically robust. They won't uh, fall apart. They don't pack or expand nearly as much. Um, here you can, this is a set of dyes I made, had made when I was in grad school. And I really like these ICL sample presses, but um, you know, your standard hydraulic sample press works too. We have those all on site. Um, likely you'll also have many samples to characterize. So um, we have multiple sample holders. Here you see a four slot for a digit vert sample holder, um, which are available at all beam lines now. Um, we also have an eight slot variety for this. Um, if your samples are pretty small. You wanna pay attention to make sure you don't get cross-contamination. You can see you put tape on one side and then cover the other hole, load your sample, and then work your way through the sample. You can put pellets in here. You can put loose powders in here. You can put soils in here. Um, you can't put solutions in here, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, this is our old data queue. It, for those of you that don't collect data at 4.1 or 11.2, it won't look like this anymore. 
uh, but the principle is the same. We can write a queue that will move between the different samples and in some cases change conditions for you to collect data automated. And this is becoming ever more robust, um, especially as we're moving to remote data collection and um, beam on scientists collecting data for you, which we'll talk about later. Um, like I said, four and eight slot varieties and down here on the left, you can see a digit vert. Um, we can put these in most sealed environments, so we can run them under helium, we can run, run them under nitrogen, whatever you want. Um, in this box, they seal, um, and we can burn through samples. That way pretty quick. So also we have, if you guys are radio, have radioactive samples or they're photoactive or anaerobic, we have a number of means to get around this. Um, I'm gonna start going a little faster here as I'm trying to keep this talk under an hour. Um, if your sample is measurably radioactive, we require certain precautions and the beam line selection uh, may be affected. Um, certain levels of radiation may require certain beam lines. So if you're highly radioactive, um, looking at transuranics, um, stuff like that, you're probably limited to 11 to in a lot of cases where we have a tent in the hutch itself to secure it. And you'll need to start talking to RP and Matt Padilla if not, if that, if that is you. Um, also, our RPFO, who are the people who kind of oversee this, um, we have certain sample holders that may be required. So in this case, it's a liquid nitrogen cryostat, um, where we can also do, if you want to be anaerobic or cold, we can do this. It's not just for radioactive samples. So we do a lot of environmental science in these types of cryostats, um, where they're looking at kind of photoactive or x-ray sensitive samples, and they need to stay cold and air free. Um, like I said, it minimizes photo damage and it acts as sample containment. And also as a built-in sample holder, these plates are specific. And if you need to use them, contact me or another Beamline scientist and we can either send you a file so you can have a machine or in the new abnormal, we may send them out to you. Um, and I said before, we can serve, purge most sample boxes with helium if you just have, you just need an anaerobic environment. Um, if you need to be really cold and you need to know how cold you are, we have liquid helium cryostats. Um, so you can see it's another third form, fourth or fifth form for whatever we're talking about here. It's on the end of a rod. They usually fit in these little plates here. Um, and you can control temperature. Um, new to this, which I don't talk about here, we, these are, I think I talk about it here, but now we do have a multiple sample format for this available at 7.3, um, hopefully soon available at most beam lines. Um, we can provide an inert atmosphere. Um, it's actually under helium when it's collected, it can pull vacuum on it too, and is capable of reaching 4K. Uh, we can use them in transmission and fluorescence. And like I said, now available multi-sample holder for liquid helium cryostance. So you can run, I think, up to four samples per plate. So you're not changing, pulling this rod out for every sample. Um, if you have a liquid, which we do, um, they can be done both in transmission and fluorescence. We have these, this one is a Teflon plate where you put tape on both sides and insert it, insert your, your syringe or solution into it. Uh, make sure your tape and cell materials can put compatible with your solvent. So if you were to put, if your sample is dissolved in acetone, this isn't going to work. So you need to talk about that with your beam line scientist. Um, Another concern is if in the beam your solvent starts evaporating, you're changing your concentration. Um, we can mitigate that to a certain extent. Um, bubbles can form. We, that needs to be, bubbles will basically create a sample free void that will then alter your, will make your data useless. So those are things you need to think about. Um, and okay, is your sample subject to beam damage, photochemistry, or bubbles, overwhelming signal? If that is the case, we have another workaround for that, which is we can freeze them. Um, here you see, again, the sample, we have these different formats, we call them dog bones. You wrap them in tape and insert sample into the side here. You'll then freeze it in liquid nitrogen and quickly insert it into the cryostat before it melts. Um, ice crystals can form in this case, so depending on your solvent, so you have those can be mitigated in some a lot of cases with the cryoprotectant um, dissolving sucrose or ethylene glycol into your solution will help with that. Um, cell adhesive and compatibility can be minimized 
by immediately quenching your sample in LN2. So like I said, like if your sample might dissolve this semi slowly, you can quench it real quick um, and prevent leaking also because the surface, the contact area for adhesive is pretty small. Um, so now I'm gonna kind of transition into just showing you, just kind of giving you the basic, not basic, more, a more in-depth look into types of experiments you do to synchrotron. Because a lot of times the users will show up and see other experiments that people are doing and be like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. Can I do that? Well, if you can do that your first time here, that saves you a trip. Um, but all of these different experiments require you talking to a B-Mind scientist before your beam time. Um, this requires advanced planning on our part and your part to make happen. Um, operando, like, so in this case, we have an operando thermocatalysis, which I don't really, none of the, none of the standard BMI and scientists work with this a whole lot anymore. Um, if you're interested in doing experiments like this, um, you want to talk to Simon Baer and Adam Hoffman and their coaxis program. They are kind of our, our first contact point for thermocatalysis experiments at this point. Um, but like I said, they do, uh, or like we talk, we do gas handling. So, but you, the information you'll need is what gases do you require, or what flow rates, and are they toxic and flammable? Because we do need to take certain safety precautions. Um, flow cell considerations. If you want to look at a high Z element, something like palladium, your sample, your your flow cell construction has different limitations than if you want to look at something like manganese. You know, X-ray penetration, um, signal in, signal out. And those are all different things. Uh, what kind of pressure regime? This sample will sell you here is capable of going to 50 bar and greater than 500 C. Um, do you want kinetically relevant experiments? Do you just, do you, you know, do you need a plug flow reactor? Do you, or you just want to look at a pellet as it, your sample as it reduces if you make a pellet? Um, there's a couple of forms for that. And do you want product characterization? Um, I know in, we have GCMS and inline RGA available. At the synchrotron, um, that's generally now handled through coaxis, and so you'd want to talk to them. Um, but you can definitely reach out to your beamline scientist, and we can point you in the right direction. And you can see an example of these experiments. Um, these are looks like zinc edge. Is that right? Uh, this is copper up top and zinc at bottom as a product of temperature. Um, and what happens under different environments? You can see 200 C under hydrogen, uh, CO2. So you can monitor the state of your system with reaction flow. Um, we also do grazing incidence X, XAS. So grazing incidence is a, a, a surface sensitive technique. Um, it uses total external reflection. So your X-ray is basically bounced off and the evanescence wave created is, allows you to probe the top two few nanometers um, of your sample. So this is great for interfacial experiments. Um, surface sensitive experiments. You can do depth profiling with this. Um, we've used it extensively. We designed um, an electrochemical cell for reduction of CO2. So we look at the interface between the electrolyte solvent and the catalyst surface and as a product of potential. So we apply a potential to that. Um, you can see we have to have, the limitations for this is we have to have an extremely small solvent layer because we have to get x-rays in and out and at a grazing incidence, your path length gets really long. Um, you can see we have a counter electrode of platinum wire that mounts above it and it's a 30 micron platinum wire. And we have to have a continuous smooth solvent flow of uh, CO2 saturated solvent and it needs to be smooth so we get no noise introduction. Um, and so the solution we came up with because sat subtractive machining, but your standard machining would have been near impossible and, or extremely experiment expensive. So what we came up with these 3D printed cells where you can see we have flow in, flow out, a, we, a small form factor reference electrode, the two platinum wires over the top, you can see right here, a small electrolyte flow, and that's all covered in Kapton, and you can see that here. We have an HPLC pump to ensure smooth flow, um, a bubbled uh, reservoir, so the gas goes, uh, we're bubbling CO2 through here, and that gas is, that electrolyte is sent through the cell and back out. And you can see here, there's the nickel edge, we're looking at nickel CO2 reduction catalysts. Um, and here up at the top left is what the beamline looks like in that configuration. We have a, a two circle Huber, 100 element detector, we have an, uh, an area, a pixelated area detector up here, so we can do simultaneous reflectivity, XAS, and XRD 
uh, or not simultaneous, but concurrent or subsequent on the same sample, which is pretty cool. Um, also, we've used the same kind of technique to look at alloy molten salt interfaces. So molten salts are uh, gaining popularity for their use, or new molten salts are gaining popularity for uh, solar energy. Um, and so we were tasked with characterizing how a Haynes, which is a nickel super alloy, interacts with a chloride-based salt at elevated temperature. Um, and we were able to look at um, the chromium K edge through a chloride salt overlayer at elevated temperature. And you can see the excess of the surface um, and how that changes with temperature. We can use what's called a um, angle curve. It's basically a reflectivity curve over the critical angle and looking at fluorescence and see how the chromium is changing or where the, the depth of it is changing as the experiment proceeds. We can also look at the bulk of it by tilting the angle in higher. We can look at a bulk like sample. So you can see the x-axis between these two situations are different. And you can see that here at the chromium edge, we go from a, an FCC chromium. The chromium is an alloy constituent of the Haynes alloy goes from an FCC chromium constituent to a oxidic chromium species with temperature as it's leached out. And that is a lot of information for how that, the corrosion pathways in that system. Um, we've covered a number of tools to do different types of experiments in grazing incidents. We have flow cells for less low, for mid to high energy experiments. Um, with dynamic flow, we have static flow, um, elevated temperature, and this is just a standard Anton Parr. Um, we have these are pretty available and you'd need to talk to me or your beamline scientists about using these. Um, we have the 3D printing technology that makes these is pretty high end. And so you would need to farm it out to a printing bureau unless you have, you know, a multi or, a, you know, a half million dollar 3D printer. Um, we've also done environmental science where we were flowing a solution um, of biologic and abiotic manganese reduction. Um, so this was a study to see how manganese oxide was for, or manganese was formed during um, in prehistoric times. I'm not an environment. I just helped design the experiment. Um, but basically, when there was no oxygen in the environment, how was manganese oxidized? Um, and so we had to come up with a way to flow the solution and have what they called bugs doing chemistry on it in the solution. So we had a HPLC pump. Or no, this is a peristaltic pump flow into the reactor um, and back into the, the large volume. And we were monitoring pH and sampling it while we were doing that. And that was a pretty cool experiment. But we can, and we 3D printed all of this. So, um, you know, if you have a hard experiment, the easiest thing to do is to early on reach out and contact one of us. And we can design experiments like this with you guys. Um, kind of some of the general use equipment. For experiments like these that we make available to everybody is we have potentia stats for electrochemistry or battery people. We have HPLC pumps um, and uh, more equipment beyond that you just might want to ask. Um, so that kind of wraps us up for the most part. Um, a couple of COVID-19 updates would be that um, if you're interested in beam time during the pandemic, we are offering our services. We're building up to remote access where you'll send your samples in, we'll load them for you and you'll characterize them from home or you'll send them to us and we'll characterize them for you while you look at the data as it's generated, giving us um, feedback on what, how and how you want the beam time to proceed. So we have a, with the samples kind of have to meet several criterion, criteria. Um, you need to prepare them at home. They need to be capable of being shipped to and from SSRL and they meet defined form factors, which um, we, you will want to reach out to us and we can define those for you more greatly. Um, like I said, we'll collect the data or it'll be by remote ask, access. And currently the fall schedule is already in the works, so it wouldn't be for fall, it'd be for winter beam time. So um, reach out to us or to Kathy Knotts. She would be a good contact, or she is a good contact for getting this moving forward. So to wrap it all up is the pleas of the BMON scientist. Um, like I said, the, uh, a lot of this applies to how things were. Um, you're not gonna arrive on the beam line, but if you do get beam time and we're back to normal, please be on the beam line around like 10, 10 a.m. We may not be there, we may be at a different beam line, but we'll, if you're there, we can start asking questions, interacting and getting you up and running. Um, you have to fill germanium detectors and please remember, um, and log it that you did it. And we'll talk about that when you're at the beam line. Um, 
And also use the resources that I showed at the beginning of the talk. Get as much a priori knowledge about your samples and the technique and the information you need want to learn from the experiment before you get here. Um, if you have to just, we have to figure that stuff out when you get to the synchrotron, it just eats a lot of your bean time. And sometimes you get three days a year to do these experiments and you don't want to waste time talking about the nuts and bolts of XAS theory. Um, it's not a good use of your time. Um, and get the, it, you know, a lot of people run samples for collaborators and that's fine, except when they don't tell you anything or you don't know anything. They're like, I don't know my, he just wanted me to collect nickel edge on the sample. And so that doesn't, again, that doesn't do you any favors or me any favors. Um, handle your chemical waste properly. That's a big if, and that applies if you actually ever come here. Um, you'll have to go through a little bit of training and one of our lab people will go train you and they'll tell you how to handle it properly and all the information's there. And if you leave samples behind, we then have to try to figure out what they are, whose they are, and it becomes a huge time sink. Um, so please make sure you handle your waste properly. And again, help us help you. Um, the more information you can give us, the earlier you start talking to us, the better. Um, so don't be the kid, although that looks kind of fun. Thanks. Um, I think we're doing a Q&A after this. I will be, I think I'm live. All right. Thanks, guys.